What's up guys and welcome back to Monink. If you guys are new here, then what is up? My name's Erica. Hey, how you doing? And if you're into the history of the ancient Greeks and the Romans, maybe you're just into the mythology and maybe, maybe you're just here because you want to hear about the wooden horse incident in mythology. Well, then this is not only the video for you, this is also the channel for you. You guys are going to want to hit that subscribe button and the bell icon so that you know every single time I post in the future. But on topic of today's video, and as you can see from the title, we're going to be going into Virgil's Aeneid book two. So if I could summarize book two into one sentence, it would be that the Greeks create a giant wooden horse and defeat the Trojans. This is one of the most, if not the most, famous moment in all of mythology. But I just want to say a note here, just so that everybody can remember that this is a Roman myth. It's a retelling of a Greek myth. Obviously, it's a retelling of the Greek legend of what happened between the Greeks and the Trojans and how exactly Troy fell. However, we do not have this episode that survives from the Greek cycle. That's Utterly, utterly important because this account is told not only from a different point of view, because it's told from Aeneas's point of view, right, who was a Trojan, but also it was written about 700 years later. So it's a very, very long time later. So we have no idea if this actually matches up to the Greek side of things, if this is exactly what went down, or if Virgil is embellishing it to make the Trojans look a little bit better, to therefore make the Italians look a little bit better. We don't really know, okay? So just bear that in mind that this is a Roman retelling of a Greek myth. Greek legend, whichever one you want to go with. So in saying that, why don't we just roll into the narrative? Where I left you guys in the last book, Dido had just asked Aeneas after they had eaten this feast, they're all sitting around, they finished eating, and Dido had asked Aeneas to recount how he made it from the burning walls of Troy all the way to North Africa, which is where he's currently sitting with the queen. Aeneas starts this book by saying to all of the uh, moved Phoenicians, because remember they're all Phoenicians who have moved over to North Africa. He says to all of them, you know what, this is kind of a sensitive topic considering it's my home that burned to the ground. But if you really want to hear the story, then I guess I could tell it, but just bear in mind it's a long story and it's pretty late. But no, okay, you guys all look really excited to hear exactly how Troy felt. So I guess I'm telling the story now. So Aeneas opens by telling his audience that actually the Greeks uh, were denied victory for a very, very long period of time. Right, okay, so like years and years and years, they could not beat the Trojans until a goddess gets involved, right? And that's key for this storytelling that if it wasn't for the goddess getting involved, they wouldn't have had one up over the Trojans. So the Greeks are aided by Minerva and they are given this idea to build this giant wooden horse. Now, what they do is they decide to pack up all of their, um, you know, all of their camps and put them all in the ships have the ships sail away. So they go and they hide behind the island of Tenedos. Aeneas does tell his audience this. Hide behind the island of Tenedos. They leave a massive open space where they once were and in its place was this wooden horse. But the wooden horse is not some like dainty, teeny, tiny thing, right? This thing is huge. Aeneas tells us that it's about the size of a mountain. In fact, it's so big that the Greeks had to use, um, they had to use like the, the trunks of pine trees in order to construct the ribs, okay? That is how big this horse is. It's fucking massive. The Greeks leave it in this space as a fake votive offering for Minerva. However, what they really did was hide their best soldiers inside the belly of the horse. And when Aeneas is telling this, he says, you know, I know this now, but at the time I had no clue. None of us did. Aeneas says that the Trojans see this from the safety of the city. They see that there's suddenly no Greeks in their camp. There's suddenly this giant horse and they're a little bit tentative to go outside. You know, this is against meme culture on the internet, by the way. There are lots of memes saying that like the Trojans are really dumb and they just kind of initially led in the, the Trojan horse without actually inspecting it. And that's not true, according to Aeneas's uh, story here in the Aeneid, that actually they were all really tentative to go outside and eventually they do. And about 50% of the people who go outside, there's a lot of men who go out to inspect this Trojan horse. And only about half of them actually think that they've won. Half of them come down to the wooden horse and they immediately start celebrating. They start realizing, or they start thinking even, that the Greeks have now left, they've gone home to Mycenae. And so the Trojans have now won and they're celebrating, they're dancing around, they're screaming, we won, we won, we're victorious. But the other half of the Trojans that are out there, they don't buy any of this. In fact, a lot of them consider actually destroying the horse initially, like before they even have a chance to really inspect the horse. They're like, nope, get rid of it. The men who were skeptical actually suggest three different options. They suggest that they should push the horse off of a mountain. They suggest that they should push it into the sea or they should just set it on fire. Considering it's wood, it will burn. Whilst all the Trojans are arguing though and they're outside the city, they're screaming at each other, they're trying to figure out what to do with this wooden horse. There's a bellowing that comes from behind them, from the city walls and the city gate. And this guy is running down, screaming at them. And this guy goes, you 
Fools! How could you believe that the Greeks would leave a gift for us and not have it be a distraction? How could you trust them? This man goes by the name of Laocoon and he is an incredibly famous priest of Apollo. So when he comes down bellowing from the city, everyone stops what they're doing to listen to him. He says to them that possibly the horse itself is the problem, right? He says that this could be the issue that we have to deal with, or this is a distraction to a bigger issue of the Greeks infiltrating the city, from a different gate. He says it's much more likely that that's going on rather than the Greeks just leaving us a nice gift. Who the f do you think is part of that camp that would actually do this? Ulysses? We suddenly trust him? That's Odysseus, by the way, in the Greek. So he has this moment where he yells at all of them. He says he doesn't trust the Greeks. And in fact, he says one of the most famous lines from all of Roman literature. And I'm gonna say it to you in the Latin because I'm a massive nerd and it's so beautiful in the Latin. It's line 49 and Laocoon says, Timeo Daneos et Dona Ferentis, which means I fear Greeks bearing gifts. And on that note, before anybody can argue with him or agree with him, Laocoon actually picks up his spear and he fires it into the belly of the wooden horse. And actually when it gets in there, it's thrown with such force that it like, it like reverberates, right? It like vibrates in the side of it and everybody's watching it being like, he's pissed. And more importantly, what I think about in this scene is what the f was going through the Greek's head inside the horse when all of a sudden this random ass spear comes jutting into the side of it and they're probably sitting there all like, like, I don't know in this moment if it's more impressive that the Greeks came up with the wooden horse or if it's the fact that they all remained silent when Laocoon's spear came bundling through. Anyways, just my thought process. Continuing with the story though, that before anybody can respond again to Laocoon, that as this thing is sticking out and it's the, the spear is sticking out and it's vibrating, there's another intrusion into the meeting. And in fact, it's two shepherds this time. And in between them, they are holding a bound Greek soldier. So everyone stops what they're doing. Cause they're like, where the f does this man come from? The shepherds tell the assembly initially that they don't know who he is. They didn't question him too much. They just found him in the field. He was very willing to hand himself over. He was very willing to get bound by the wrist, bound by the ankles. He didn't put up a fight and he just was so willing to come to the whole Trojan assembly. And so they're like, that's a little bit fishy. Aeneas, as he's telling the story to Dido and to his current audience in the moment, he says that now he knows that this man was part of the scheme, but at the time they had no idea. They had no idea that the Trojan horse was part of a scheme. They had no idea that this Greek soldier coming in was part of the scheme. And it's now in the story that he says, if the gods were on their side, then Laocoon would have demanded that the horse be open in that moment. And it didn't matter what this Greek soldier then said, because they would have seen all of the other Greek soldiers hidden inside the belly. But unfortunately the gods were not on their side because the belly of the horse wasn't open and this man began to speak. So everybody prompts the Greek soldier to speak and initially he just says the reason why he handed himself over is because uh, he was outcast by the Greeks and he's on enemy soil. So he was like, I couldn't have won either way. The Greeks hate me, you guys hate me. So everybody who kind of wants me dead. So if you guys actually want to kill me, then I'm sure the Greeks would actually come back to pat you back on the back. They'd be like, thanks so much. We hate this man. You guys killed him. We're all friends again. Which obviously catches the Trojans off guard a little bit because they're a little bit curious as to who he is. They don't really trust him at this point. And so Priam comes forward and he asks the man who he is, where he's come from, and what exactly happened that made the Greeks want to turn against him. Because that's like unheard of in the ancient world that you would turn against a man of your own army. So our little Greek captive answers him. The Greek captive says that his name is Sinon. It is spelt like this. I'm not sure if it's Sinon in the Greek or if it said Sinon. I have always said Sinon though. So we are going to keep saying Sinon in this video. However, Sinon introduces himself as Sinon. He then says that he was brought from Argos, which is where he's from in Greece. He was brought over by uh, the leader Palimedes over to Troy and over to Trojan soil. And he says that initially when he came, it was fine, it was fun, he got on with everybody, but very quickly he started to make enemies with Ulysses and Ulysses did not like him for a plethora of reasons that he does list, but I'm not gonna go into in this video. It's not that important for the narrative. So Ulysses starts hating him and he starts spreading rumors and throughout the camp to make everybody else dislike Sinon, which obviously has thrown Sinon a little bit off. Now, the reason why this ends up being such a problem is because not only is Sinon then outed socially from everybody, but there hits a point where uh, the goddess Minerva is super pissed at the Greek army and the Greek army don't know why. Now they realize that Minerva, but also probably Apollo is mad at them because the Greeks have decided at one point or another that they want to surrender and they want to, to disappear from Troy. They just decide that the war isn't worth it. But every single time they get into their boats, there's either no wind or there's too much wind. So either it's gonna be dangerous to set sail or they, they can't set sail because there's no wind to take them. Naturally, the Greek army are just like, well, what the f 
do the gods want from us? So they send somebody called Yuri Pilos. By the way, this is all a lie. I just want to clarify as I'm telling you the story. It's all a lie. Just bear that in mind. So the Greeks have sent this guy called Yuri Pilos. They decide that he's going to go to Delphi as a solo person to go and see what Apollo exactly wants from them. So he does. He gets on his little boat. He travels all the way to Delphi by himself, stays there for a few days, comes back to the Greek camp. And when he shows back up, he says, yeah. So the gods are pretty pissed at us and what they've said is that because we spilled greek blood in order to get to troy yeah we're gonna have to spill more greek blood to get home sorry for the bad news which obviously sets all of the greeks off the greeks are like are you joking we have to do this again we don't want a phigenia 2.0 but if this is the only way we can go home i guess we have to do it only because it worked the first time so it's probably gonna work a second time terrible logic but it's a lie that the trojans would believe based off of what happened for the greeks to get there so supposedly ulysses is super pissed by this news though and he brings in calchas who is a seer so calchas comes through and they ask him you know what are we supposed to do who do the gods want are we supposed to sacrifice somebody here or, or what's the deal and calchas has a moment where he says yep yeah, okay the gods clearly do want to sacrifice that is decided, but I don't want to tell you who it is. I don't want anybody to be put on the chopping block, quite literally, because I like everybody here and I don't think it's worth it. And again, all of the Greeks, super pissed at this, including Ulysses. He is mad as f Calchas, though, doesn't say anything for 10 days, according to Sinon's story. That for 10 days, he stays quiet, and eventually on the 10th day, and Sinon believes that he says this because everybody hated Sinon anyways, he offers Sinon up uh, on a silver platter for him to be sacrificed. So the day comes where Sinon is going to be sacrificed, and he's bound, you know, like an animal. He's dragged through, like, this whole procession and all of this. And he starts getting really scared because obviously he doesn't want to be a human sacrifice in this moment, which is totally understandable. And so he breaks his bonds and he runs and he goes to hide in a bunch of reeds, right? And he hides there until he realizes, well, until he thinks it's safe enough to leave and that the Greeks have, have disappeared because they're probably going to come and kill him anyways. And that's the moment where Sinon then decides to walk through the Trojan farms to try and get himself captured because he realizes I can't go back to Greece because if I go back to Greece, heaven forbid they're going to come and track me down. Heaven forbid they're going to track down my family and kill them. They might have already done that because they hate me so much they think that I have insulted them and the gods so what else was I supposed to do which is why he then came into uh, contact with the shepherds and which is why he also then comes to the assembly very very willingly because he has no home and he's understood that again I want to clarify this is all a lie this is something that he's telling the Trojans in order for the Greek plan to work okay so none of this really happened this is just a story that he's telling in order for them to believe that the Greeks have left so anyways the Trojans hearing the story Priam is completely shook by it like he cannot believe that one they would want to do a, a human sacrifice again but two that they would try and sacrifice this man who was standing right in front of them. And Priam, oh, you guys, it's so sad because it's such a cute moment. Priam looks at Sinon and he says, I, I have no idea how you've endured this. This is despicable on the Greeks' part. You don't deserve this. And you know what? You are considered Trojan now, okay? Troy is your home. We are your brothers and sisters. You can absolutely stay with us. But we do have a question that in order for us to trade this whole, you know, you become Trojan, we don't try and kill you, even though you've tried to kill us for the last decade. Um, what the is up with the horse. We just need to know what, what does this have to do with the whole story? Sinon obviously obliges and he has this moment where he looks up to the heavens and I'm pretty sure this is considered blasphemy, but he screams up to the gods and he's just like, I don't have to keep my promises to any of the Greeks. I'm going to tell all of their secrets and the gods can't punish me because the Greeks tried to kill me. Again, all a lie. But anyways, he's screaming up to the heavens. So the Trojans believe him at this point because they think he wouldn't do this unless he wanted to be killed by the gods. Ha ha ha, jokes. And Sinon then explains what the horse was for. And it's because Minerva got super mad at the Greeks because Diomedes and Ulysses, they actually go into one of Minerva's temples close to Troy, not at Troy, but close to Troy. And they had stolen this uh, palladium, which is a wooden statue of the goddess. Now, when they bring this palladium back to the Greek camps, the goddess immediately starts showing that she's not thrilled by this and she feels very offended they would do this. And she does this by having the statue, you know, like smoke and like the eyes come up in flames and everything. It's super spooky to the point where Ulysses and Diomedes are scared shitless that they go and they call Calchas to look at the statue and they're like, what the f is going on with this thing? Calchas in this lie then explains to them, okay, well, you have to build this giant horse. Uh, as, a, as an appeasement to the goddess and she'll be happy. You have to obviously return the whole Palladium thing because that is, a, that, that's like a big no. But yeah, build this horse and she should be happy if you guys just leave it um, and and yeah. The end part of what Calchas says to Ulysses and Diomedes is the most important part of this whole lie. And even Aeneas has a moment where he does stress to his audience, if it wasn't for this, maybe, you know, we wouldn't have been as convinced, but it's because Calchas told 
Ulysses and told Diomedes that if the Trojans were to see the horse once they've left, if they see the horse and they defile it, then it will mean that there will be, uh, well, basically Troy will be destroyed. I was just gonna say that in like a really whimsical way, but basically Troy is gonna fall if they don't accept the offering to Minerva. However, if they do take it into the city and if they do accept it as a, as a viable offering to the goddess, then it would mean that Troy will not fall, actually, that Troy will be victorious, it will still stand, the Greeks would have just surrendered and their pride will be hurt, but everybody, everybody will survive. Aeneas says, Probably one of the saddest lines at the end of this, in my personal opinion, that he says to his audience that Sinon lied and all the Trojans believed him. And it f***ing sucks at the end of this when you hear this and you know exactly what's gonna happen, that he's lying through his teeth, that all the Greeks are in the belly of the horse, they're about to drag it in. I mean, come on, this is the moment where we know that the doom of Troy is just solidified. And as if we needed any more convincing, as if the Trojans needed any more convincing, after Aeneas says that everyone believed Sinon, that there are two serpents that are sent from the island of Tenedos, right? So the gods have sent two serpents because Laocoon is there, Laocoon is still where he is and he's sacrificing uh, this oxen and to all the gods, he's just doing nice rituals. And his two sons are there. And these two serpents come along the beach and they start attacking his two sons, like coiling themselves around them, coiling themselves around their necks. Like the sons are screaming, they're in total, total pain. And Laocoon leaves his sacrifice to go and run forward uh, to help his sons. And as he's doing that, the snakes start attacking him as well. This is a very famous statue, by the way. Uh, so this is what it looks like. It's in Rome. It's absolutely beautiful. But this is the moment that is so famous for the Trojans because if there was any last person that needed convincing, that was the moment because they believed that because Laocoon was the only person to have actually challenged the wooden horse, right? He threw his spear into it. He actually defiled it, that he and his sons were punished for it. Right, so based off of the lie that Sidon just told them that Calchas had warned and said, oh, well, you know, Troy is gonna fall if anybody defiles this horse. And then to see this happen, all of the Trojans were like, bring it the f in and bring it in quickly. So they all start bringing in the horse. And apparently when it gets to the gate of Troy, when it gets up to the gates, that there's a threshold right there, right? So there's like kind of like a dip and a little bit of a ramp to get up to the city. And when they try, the Trojans have to tug it four times until it actually gets over this threshold and into the city, which is heartbreaking because it seems like fate is really on their side to be like, don't do it. But they still, they make sure that the horse gets in there and they think they've won, right? They think that this is it. This is a sign from the gods that the Greeks have off that they are now going to be victorious they're going to go down in history for challenging this great greek army and so what do they do they spend the whole day having a festal day they celebrate the whole time they're you know screaming they're chanting they have all these ribbons everywhere the horse is drawn right into the middle of the citadel and everybody is partying around it and it's a very good last day for troy last day being the key but as night falls over troy aeneas tells his audience that that is when everything goes basically, because night falls and Sinon, who has been given his own f sleeping quarters because the Trojans are so goddamn hospitable, Sinon comes out of his quarters and he lets loose the greatest of the Greeks, Aeneas tells us, right? So a rope comes down from the wooden horse into the ground and we've got Pyrrhus, who's Achilles' son, comes out of the horse. We've got Menelaus, Agamemnon, Diomedes, Ulysses, they all start piling out of the wooden horse whilst all of Troy is asleep. In the darkness, they first of all target the guards who are closest to the gates. They target all of the guards that they can see, kill all of them. And that way they can open the gates because as this is happening, the Greek ships have come back round from the island of Tenedos to park where they were before. All of those Greek soldiers are coming off of their boats and now coming into the city. Very, very quickly, this scene turns to utter mayhem. They just start killing everyone in Troy. They're like, you guys can't believe you bought that. Here we are. And Aeneas cuts the story to him actually. And he's in bed because he doesn't really know what was going on. He just knows that mayhem is going on. And when he's in bed, he gets visited by the ghost of Hector. So Hector comes forward and Aeneas actually stops him. Before Hector can say anything in his dream, Aeneas stops him and he's like, yo, man, what is going on? He asks him like a hundred questions that are totally irrelevant to the moment. And Hector, rightfully so, ignores all of them. Hector's just like, Aeneas, not now, I've got shit to tell you. He tells Aeneas that it's Troy's final day and that it's now Aeneas's job to carry on the Trojan race, to run out of Troy, to save what he can, to save the household gods, to save who he can, to get out of the city and to move the city to a different place. Now he does highlight that if he was still alive, it would be his job to do that. But because Hector has been killed, as we know from the Iliad, he was killed by Achilles, that it's now in Aeneas's hands because Aeneas is a good, uh, he's a good leader. And so Hector trusts him to do this job. Aeneas wakes up from this dream. He's a little bit rattled by it. He's like, what the f but he can hear all of this, you know, crap happening outside. And so he goes up to the roof of his house. And where Aeneas's house is, is that it's sort of pulled back 
from uh, the citadel from the center. So there's lots of trees around it. He's got lots of space. Gets up to the roof and he can see everything burning. It's just all in flames. So he panics, rightfully so, he panics and he comes downstairs and he starts putting on his armor and he opens up the front door. And when he opens up the front door, there's another priest of Apollo outside. And Aeneas is like, what is happening in the city? Like what's gone on? And the priest of Apollo just looks to him and he says, Troy is falling, Troy is burning. It's our final day. Get out if you can, just, just run. There's no way that we can survive this. Now, instead of listening to this priest of Apollo, he instead finishes putting on all of his armor and then he puts on his helmet and he leaves to go and fight, right? His first instinct is to get into battle and to save as many people as he can from the burning citadel, not to worry about his family and not to worry about what the ghost of Hector told him and not to worry about what this other priest of Apollo told him, but that's fine. That's Aeneas for you. So he runs into the center of the city and I have to say there are a number of different fight scenes in this moment, like it goes on for a really long time, where we get different names of different Trojans coming up, different Greeks that they killed, how they infiltrated all of these different armies and how they actually made a good amount of progress, I have to say. We gotta hand it to Aeneas in this moment. He fights his way all the way to the palace of Priam. And when he's telling the story to Dido and to all of the people, he tries to wrap it up really quickly where he says, you know, I got to the palace, uh, Priam died, Hecuba was in there, the whole thing was on fire, that was the final days of Troy, and then we all died, and then I had to run around, and then that was it, and then I left, and now I'm here. Unfortunately, though, his audience, not happy about this, like, at all. Dido and the Phoenicians sort of egg him on, and they're just like, well, how did Priam die? Like, how did Troy fall? What happened to you? How did you get out of the city? You want to give us a little bit more detail? Because that's that's like the only part that we actually wanted to know. So Aeneas does have a moment where he takes a breath and he's just like, all right, fine, you want the details? I'll tell you the details, but they're not happy. I don't know why you keep asking me all these questions. But alas, he goes into the story and he starts off by telling us that he was actually in the palace when Priam died. And the story goes, he gets into the palace and he starts seeing just fire is everywhere, right? Okay, the Greeks have totally infiltrated and supposedly Priam in this moment, because it's overrun by Greeks and it's overrun by fire at this point, he's a super old man, Priam, but he decides it's now gonna be his time to fight. Bear in mind, he hasn't fought in the last 10 years of the war because he's too old. And now he tries to muster up the strength to protect his family and to protect his city. So he's putting on all of his armor and his wife Hecuba turns around and sees him doing this and goes, what the f are you doing? There are far more Greeks than there are Trojans here. We're all gonna die together, but if we happen to survive, let's at least be together. Like, don't run off. Don't try and be a savior. It's not gonna work. You're too old for that. So come sit with us, sit with your family by the altar. Let's hope that the gods watch over us, that the gods spare us, hopefully, please. And we'll sit there and take refuge. And again, if we all die together, we all die together. And if we all survive, we all survive together. And Priam agrees that Priam goes to sit with Hecuba and with, you know, like his a million children at this point, because there are so many sons and daughters of Priam, that they all go and sit by the altar. And Aeneas tells us that actually one of his sons was running through the palace trying to protect all of them and fight off Pyrrhus, who's Achilles' son, who was like the most terrifying of all of the Greeks at this point. The son of Priam is running through the palace. He's getting chased by Pyrrhus and he runs all the way into the room where the altar is. And right in front of Priam, he's about a couple of steps from his parents. And when he stands there, all of a sudden he stops, he looks at the king and the queen, and then he vomits up blood in front of them and falls forward. And behind him is revealed Pyrrhus has just killed him by stabbing him in the back, which sets Priam off. He is not happy about this. He stands up and he screams at Pyrrhus and he's like, what the f is wrong with you? Your father was a better man than you will ever be. He at least respected his enemies. He would have never killed a son in front of a father because it's the most disrespectful thing you can do, especially to a king. Who do you think you are? Pyrrhus, unfortunately, doesn't give a that an old man is yelling at him and he says, well, I'm about to kill you. So when you go down to the underworld, you can tell my dad how unlike him I am. Boo hoo, now die. Like he literally says the now die line and it just like always, it always flabbergasts me that he says this. Cause I'm like, who the f writes that into literature now die? That's like a villain's line in like a Disney film. Pyrrhus, come on. Anywho, he says that they get into a little bit of an altercation, a little bit, that's a massive understatement. They get into a massive fight, right? And it ends with, Pyrrhus leaning over and dragging Priam through his son's blood, because obviously his son's blood is all over the floor, drags him through there and up onto the altar. And when he gets Priam up onto this altar, he chops his head off. Yeah, it's fucking brutal. In fact, one of the lines that Aeneas says is line 558, 
and he says that now Priam's body, because obviously he doesn't have a head and his body is, you know, they're not, they're separate. The line is a corpse without a name. So that is how the end of Priam was, was that actually he wasn't even honored like a king. He wasn't given a respectful burial. Um, he was just hacked to death on an altar. Lovely stuff from this book. Anywho, let's move on. Aeneas now tells us that this is the moment where he decided he needed to get home, right? Because the whole of Troy is falling, that like literally there's fire in the palace and all of his friends are either being engulfed by the flames or they're being killed by the Greeks. So he's like, well, I should probably go make sure that my wife, my son and my dad are at least gonna be in safety even if I die along the way. So he goes to leave the palace and as he's leaving the palace, he actually comes across Helen, that he sees Helen hiding, taking refuge in the temple of Vesta. Seeing this, Aeneas just just gets so pissed. His blood is boiling seeing Helen like this because he doesn't realize, and he tells us now in the moment when he's telling the story, he doesn't realize that Helen does this because she's terrified that either she doesn't know if the Greeks are gonna even accept her, maybe they'll kill her, maybe the Trojans are gonna kill her. She feels like everybody is blaming her for this whole war. And Aeneas in this moment, he didn't know that. He's just hating her because obviously Troy is falling and he does initially uh, blame her. So he starts advancing onto where Helen is with his sword drawn because he wants to stab her and kill her because he thinks otherwise she's gonna go to Greece, she's gonna have a great life, she's gonna be be reunited with her husband, with her daughter. She's gonna go home. She's gonna be treated like a queen all over again. And the Trojan women who so hospitably accepted her into the city, they're gonna become her slaves. They're gonna become her servants. And that's so as he's very, very close to her, actually, he's about to go up and stab her. Thankfully, Venus, his mother, steps in front of him and goes, Woo! What the f do you think you're doing? This is not her fault. This has nothing to do with her anymore. Now the fall of Troy is all down to the gods. Do not let your rage get the better of you. This has nothing to do with her. It has nothing to do with you. And what she does in order to prove this to him, in order to really calm him down, is that she takes away the mist from his eyes and she tells him to turn towards the city. And when he turns around, he can actually see. It's a beautiful scene, I have to say. Like literature wise, the scene is stunning because he sees the gods, the real form of the gods, tearing away brick by brick at the walls of Troy, at the palace of Troy. Everything is done by the gods. And in fact, there's one, one of my favorite descriptions is how Neptune had unhinged the part of land where uh, Troy is sitting and he's shaking it like visibly, like he's just unhinged that one little part so that Troy itself will fall. And that's what Aeneas sees and that's all he really needs to see in order to believe that it has nothing to do with Helen, it has nothing to do with any mortal at this point. It's now in the hands of the gods and the gods have decided that Troy is is falling. So this is what prompts him to run home, right? He's really worried about his family. He goes home, he goes into the threshold and he's just like, right, everybody, dad, get the fuck up. His dad lives with him. Dad, get up. We're gonna leave Troy. We're gonna escape. Get Creusa, get my son, let's go. Unfortunately, his dad has a like classic dad moment where he's like super old man, he's laying in bed and he's like, no, I'm so old. There's no point of saving me. I'm going to stay here. I've already survived one siege of Troy because Troy was, it was sieged twice, but you don't need to know that. This is not the second time that Troy is being attacked and Kaisis, his dad, lived through the first one. So he's in bed and he's just like, I don't need to live through a second one. And Aeneas says, okay, well, that's fine, but we're not going to leave without you. So if you stay, we're all going to stay. Which obviously his wife, not thrilled about Creusa, is like, are you joking right now? Like, I want to leave. I want to save my son. But if you're both going to be this stubborn, then fine. Please make sure that you can give me a sword or something. I'm gonna come out and fight with you because I would much rather die with you than die stuck in this home and burning up in flames. Aeneas isn't happy about this, but Creusa, his wife, does actually put their son in between them to kind of remind him like what she's fighting for and what he's fighting for. And so Eulis' little baby Ascanius, he stands in between the two of them and the two parents are looking at him. And Aeneas says that he has this moment where he sees this little flame appear on Ascanius' head and Creusa notices it too. So they start trying to tap it out but it turns out it's not an actual flame. So Anchises sees this and he says, oh my God, that looks like it's a sign from the gods. And it looks like it's a sign from the gods that we need to value our lineage to come, you know, like our future lineage, our future family, if it's on Ulysses' head. And so he calls up to the heavens and he's like, Jupiter, if this is a sign from the gods, then please let me know now that we should follow Aeneas and we should leave the city and we should bring Ascanius and Creusa and not stay here to fight. And obviously Jupiter in that moment is like, you got it. And so he lets out this massive clap of thunder it scares the bejesus out of all four of them. And Anchises is like, I guess we're leaving. So Aeneas then concocts this little plan and he tells his dad to hold him to the household gods. Cause remember Hector told him to do that. Hold him to the household gods. And he says, you're gonna sit on my shoulders because you're too old, you can't run with us. You're gonna sit on my shoulders. I'm gonna hold Ascanius's hand. And, and this is, the, this is the kicker. Creusa, you're gonna follow behind us. In the shadows, just follow where we're going. 
follow us out. Now, I would like to point out that this has never worked in mythology, okay? Let's just think of Orpheus and Eurydice, when it was like, oh, don't worry, Eurydice, just follow Orpheus out of the underworld. You'll be fine. You'll come out into the open. Orpheus won't f*** this up. Who f***s it up? Orpheus. That is exactly what's going to happen now, mind you. The reason why I just reminded you of that is because a woman following a man out physically doing anything has never worked. This is no exception. So they start walking through the burning city of Troy, right? And it's really hard to see. Aeneas is holding his dad, holding his son's hand. They're trying to move through and Creus is following behind them. And when they sort of get up to the gates of, of the city, the back gates of the city, that Anchises, he turns around and he's like, it's really hard to see, but I think I can see these warriors and they're chasing us. We need to speed up and we need to get out of here in as far away as possible because they're coming for us like right now. Which terrifies Aeneas and Aeneas starts running along the road, right? He's running because he says at this moment to his current audience, he's like, I was really worried about my dad. I was worried about my son. No mention of Creusa, just a note. So he's running along the road. He decides that's not safe enough. So he just veers off and starts running towards the trees, starts running in and out of the woods. And he only stops when he hits this uh, sacred grove to Ceres. When he hits the grove of Ceres, he stops and he gets his dad down off his shoulders, who is still holding on to the household gods, puts Ascanius down and he looks around and he's like, where the fuck is my wife? I thought she was following us. Not realizing that he had not only bolted without telling her, but then also ran through the trees when there's smoke through them and they can barely see past their own hand. He's like, how come Creusa wasn't following me? Hmm, Aeneas, I wonder why. Also, could he not have organized a Marco Polo situation with Anchises? All he was doing was holding on to the gods. Could he not have been like, by the way, can you also, whilst watching out for enemies, just watch out for Creus, so just make sure my wife's good. No, he didn't set that up. And so instead, we're supposed to feel like this moment, because when he realizes that Creus isn't there, he turns back around and he has this majestic stride back towards Troy. I'm supposed to be impressed? Are you joking? This is what I would expect him to do. And the way he tells the story is as if it's super heroic that he's gonna go back into the burning city of Troy to find Creusa. And I'm like, it's your fault that she's in this position. I expect you to go and right your wrongs. This, Aeneas, is a wrong. Anyways, as he's walking back and he's telling the Phoenicians about how he has this great walk back, he says, you know, it wasn't entirely my fault because my dad didn't notice that she wasn't behind us, nor did my son. As if bringing in an old man into it and bringing in a child is gonna make this better. Aeneas, she's your wife. She's your responsibility in this moment when you concoct a plan like this. Whatever, it, if you can't see, it genuinely bothers me that Aeneas tells the story in this way. But alas, he goes back into the burning city and he starts running around to try and find Creusa. He goes home, he goes back to the citadel. He sort of stops into a bunch of different houses to try and see if he can find her and he can't anywhere. So he's panicking and he starts just sort of wandering through the city and just calling out her name. He just starts hoping that she'll appear. Maybe she's hiding behind some wall that he doesn't know, something or other. And when he's calling her name, all of a sudden, her shade appears in front of him, her soul appears. And Aeneas says when he's telling the story to Dido that like he stopped his blood totally stopped moving in his body. He was suddenly cold. All of his hair stood up on end because he knew that this meant that Creusa had died. He feels really bad and he starts crying and he's like, oh my God, what is happening? And Creusa very, very calmly just looks at him and says, why are you crying? Why are you upset? If I've died here, it was because the gods wanted me to die here. I had nothing to do with you. The gods have taken me. They have made me safe. Because think about it. If I didn't die and if I had just been wandering through, if the Greeks, had gotten their hands on me, I would be taken back to Greece and I would be used as a slave there. And I would forever be remembered as Aeneas's wife, who is now our servant. So really, they've saved me from this life of pain. And I'm here and I'm dying with my people in Troy. And now Aeneas, it's your responsibility to continue the Trojan race, right? You must go find a new home for our people. You must go find a new home for our son. And most importantly, you've got to find a new mother for our son. You've got to go and find a woman who's going to raise him as her own, who's going to love him. And I leave this to you, don't be sad, it's okay. I understand. And literally every single woman who's reading this story is like, am I supposed to f***ing believe this sh That not only is she very calm that you left her behind, I think that's a really key point, but also she's even more comfortable with him finding a new wife after she just died. The likelihood of this is minimal. This is how Aeneas tells himself the story so that he feels better about his wife dying and having it be his fault. He's like, no, it's fine. Her ghost told me it was okay. And I'm reading it like, no, maybe what she said was the first part, which is that the gods wanted me to die here and that's fine. I don't believe for a second that she was like, go and find a new home for our son and a new bimbo to marry in place of me because I'm that replaceable. Off Aeneas. I would like to believe that Dido hearing this story for at least a moment was like, I don't think any woman said that to you. I don't know. And it frustrates the shit out of me. Like genuinely, I read it over and over again. And I'm like, Aeneas, what? 
What? Anywho, that's the story that he tells us. And then he says that, you know, he tried to hug the shade, he tried to hug the soul, but obviously it, you know, flitted away. And he did this like three times to make sure that he really couldn't hug her. And it was really sad and he cried a lot. And then he went back out to where his son and to where his dad were by the, the Grove of Ceres. They're all hiding there and there's a lot more Trojans that have come to meet them there. And that is the moment where Aeneas realizes he's going to be leading this whole group of people to found a new city. And that is really where the book ends. It ends with all of them walking off into, not really the sunset, because remember that Troy has just burned. It's really just them walking off to found a new Troy in this absolute uh, rubble and this crazy, you know, destruction of, of a city. But that's how the book ends. The next book is still going to be in Aeneas's voice telling the story, just to clarify that, um, because he's going to tell us how he then made it from Troy itself with these people through to North Africa to be sitting in front of Dido. That was just how Troy fell. Um, and then we're going to get the rest of the story. So I will be doing that next time. I hope you guys enjoyed this video. I hope it helps a little bit. So thank you guys so much for tuning in and we'll be seeing you next time with more videos here on Monique. I'll see you then.